Good evening. I'm really pleased to welcome you tonight to a conversation between two pioneering scientists about the ethics of scientific discovery. My name is Rob Reich. I'm a faculty member in the political science department and the faculty director of the Center for Ethics and Society. I also have the privilege of serving as an associate director on the new Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. I'm really pleased to introduce someone who will come and introduce the event tonight. His name is Marc Tessier Levine. He's a neuroscientist. He's the former president of Rockefeller University. He was the chief scientific officer at Genentech, and he is currently the 11th president of Stanford University. Please welcome Marc Tessier Levine. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for that introduction. And also, thank you very much for your thoughtful leadership um, and for organizing this important conversation. We often look uh, to technology to improve our lives. And in these early years of the 21st century, twin revolutions in biotechnology and in computer science offer enormous promise. Within these two fields, more specifically, Innovations in editing the genomes of humans and other organisms on the one hand, and in creating machine intelligence on the other hand, can confer enormous benefits on humanity. But they also raise urgent ethical questions and questions about their societal impact. Your presence here tonight shows your interest in these issues and also your concern, and I want to thank you all for being here. Now, in the next few minutes, I'd like to briefly touch on the promise and peril uh, that accompany innovation, the opportunities for Stanford to make a difference, and the crucial roles that collaboration and leadership play in addressing these concerns. But first, I want to thank Professors Jennifer Doudna and Fei Fei Lee for their conversation tonight, Professor Russ Altman for serving as moderator, and uh, the McCoy Family Center for Ethics and Society and Stanford HAI for bringing us all together. Now, the effects of innovation are felt all around the world, but here in Silicon Valley, we're surrounded by many of the sources and drivers of innovation. Experts here develop breakthrough ideas and build on them to create companies, products, and applications that can change lives and communities, and even the planet. Stanford itself, of course, is home to many great breakthroughs developed by faculty and current and former students. The pace of that change is rapid breathtaking, and it's only getting faster. But innovation alone isn't sufficient. Creative disruption doesn't guarantee better outcomes for society or for individuals. And disrupting just for disruption's sake is no honorable activity. As we all know, remarkable opportunities for good can also be misused. Along with the good can come uh, malicious actors, unintended consequences, and risks and real harm. Just as Stanford is known for our role in great innovations, we also have a responsibility to consider the societal and ethical dimensions of our work, and we should strive to be equally known for that as well. That's why our new long-range vision for Stanford includes a presidential initiative on ethics, society, and technology. It aims to infuse ethical and societal considerations into technological advances. Now, I understand that tickets uh, for this event went quickly. They were all gone within about half an hour after they became available, believe it or not. That demand reflects the intense interest in how innovations like gene editing and artificial intelligence can radically change how we live our lives. Gene editing and CRISPR are, are already having a sweeping impact across the life sciences in biological discovery, in biotechnology, in medicine, in, and in agriculture. AI similarly promises an array of transformational change in the future of work, of education, of medicine, of warfare, and of entire industries and economies. These two technologies have thousands upon thousands of applications and just as many implications. I believe that this potential for broad and rapid impact is at a scale that has rarely been witnessed in human history. And the speed of the changes hastens an already urgent need for discussion and for plans. Now, our speakers tonight, Jennifer Dowden and Fei Fei Li, are leading scientists who have taken their fields by storm. 
they are also both equally committed to thinking about the societal and ethical implications of their technologies. Now, I realize it's a bit ironic uh, that the two of them are going to be on stage together this week of all weeks. It's big game week. Uh, this is a time when students on this campus are eulogizing the demise of the Cal mascot, and their counterparts in Berkeley are chopping trees. <laughs> so I recognize that it's a bit of a contrast to have a Cal professor and a Stanford professor coming together in a calm, polite setting. <laughs> now, friendly rivalries often produce high levels of interest and energy and an intense focus on winners and losers. But in this fast-paced world of innovation, the definition of winners and losers are much different. When it comes to managing the impacts of these revolutionary technologies, we are all on the same team. Tonight's discussions and the questions that Fei Fei and Jennifer are raising can help serve as traffic signals, green lights for moving forward, but also awareness when to pr proceed with caution and also when to stop. For instance, Jennifer co-organized a discussion in 2015 on the ethics of making changes in the human genome, which led to a call for a moratorium pending further discussion of ethical and safety issues. Last month, in turn, Feifei and her Stanford HAI co-director, John Echemendi, argued for the need for a national vision for AI because, quote, most of the world isn't prepared to reap its benefits or to mitigate its risks. They wrote that AI is advancing rapidly, but we still have time to get it right if we act now. Now, last winter, um, Jennifer and Feifei attended a dinner that Rob hosted here at Stanford. They compared notes and realized some parallel concerns about the ethical implications of their technologies. Rob asked them to continue their conversation here tonight, and I want to thank them for doing so. I'm proud that Stanford can host discussions like these and be a part of the solutions. I believe we have the opportunity and the responsibility to help lead. Now, one component of leadership is convening experts uh, like Jennifer and Feifei. Another is helping identify and developing new leaders. So in closing, I want to say that I'm optimistic about the future, both because of the leadership and commitment of established scholars like Jennifer and Feifei, and also because of the emerging leaders who are building on their work. One of those emerging leaders is Margaret Guo, a current Stanford student who will introduce the members of this panel. Margaret is a Stanford MD-PhD student who bridges the two worlds of our speakers. Her work uses machine learning-based approaches to examine how changes in our DNA contribute to cancer, neuropsychiatric disorders, and other complex diseases. As an undergraduate at MIT, Margaret studied computer science and bioengineering, so you could say uh, she is bilingual. Um, her achievements also extended beyond the classroom and the lab to the swimming pool. Uh, she earned All-America honors as a swimmer, and she was named the two, uh, 2016 NCAA Woman of the Year, an award for student athletes who have distinguished themselves in athletics, academics, leadership, and community service. Her career goal is to become a physician scientist. So thank you for the contributions you're already making, Margaret, and thanks again to all of you for being here tonight to participate in this timely and vital conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, President Tessie Levine, for that introduction. And I am honored to be able to introduce our three guests tonight. Professor Jennifer Doudna is a professor of chemistry and molecular and cell biology at UC Berkeley. She is a co-founder and leading figure of what has been dubbed the CRISPR revolution. And her pivotal contributions to this invention of the CRISPR-Cas9 system has not only transformed the landscape of gene editing, but also has fundamentally changed how we discover new biological phenomena. For instance, as President Tessie Levine mentioned, I study gene regulation, how tiny changes in our DNA makeup can disrupt the delicate balance of what happens in a cell. Before CRISPR, we weren't able to study the genome at this fine level of detail. But now, with a tiny pair of quote-unquote molecular scissors, we can experimentally trace the effect of a single letter mutation and how it can propagate and lead to disease. 
And as the impact of CRISPR technology has grown, so has its ethical implications, particularly for human genome editing. In recent years, Professor Doudna has led many discussions regarding the ethics of CRISPR to edit human embryos and the potential to control our species' genetic future. And I think that sounds a bit like a sci-fi movie. So our next speaker is no less involved in this broader discussion about the future of sci-fi, I mean, of our humanity's future. Although she might be a little more worried about robotic takeovers instead. Professor Fei-Fei Li is a professor of computer science here at Stanford University and is also the co-director of the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, also known by the acronym HAI. During her sabbatical two years ago, she served as vice president at Google, as well as chief, chief AI scientist at Google Cloud. Professor Lee has been a key contributor in the fields of machine learning, computer vision, and neuroscience. Notably, she is the inventor of ImageNet, which is a widely used benchmarking tool in deep learning and computer vision. In addition to her many technical accolades, she is also a leading voice advocating for diversity in STEM and for shaping public policy at a national level. Last year, Professor Fei-Fei Li spoke in front of Congress regarding the growing role of AI in our society. And in that hearing, she stated, quote, we like Professor Fei-Fei Li's quotes apparently, there is nothing artificial about AI. It is inspired by people, it is created by people, and most importantly, it impacts people. And that statement could well be the theme tonight, as for the first time on this stage, we're bringing together these two trailblazers, Professors Fei-Fei Li and Jennifer Doudna, as we delve into the emerging technologies in society and what we, as a people, make of it. Tonight's conversation will be moderated by Professor Russ Altman, and Russ is my PhD advisor, so I promise that I have not received any incentive whatsoever to say nice things about him. Um, professor Altman is the archetype of a multidisciplinary guru. He is a professor of bioengineering, genetics, medicine, and biomedical data science at Stanford University. He is also a practicing physician in internal medicine and clinical informatics. And with this unique lens, he has become a pioneer in the field of biomedical inf informatics. And in particular, his research focus on, focuses on applications of computational technology to medicine and its therapeutic potential. Of note, Professor Ullman hosts a podcast titled The Future of Everything, which explores how science, technology, and medicine have transformed the way we live. So tonight, we think about the future of CRISPR and AI and ponder the ethics of discovery. And before we begin, I'd like to take a step back and place these discoveries on a time scale. Not even 10 years ago, we would not have imagined a phrase, crispering babies for disease treatment. We would not have imagined that databases of human faces would cause so much geopolitical consternation across the globe. And we may not have imagined a future where doctors may be replaced by robot, robots. With all these possibilities, my future occupation and many others on the line, there is a sense of urgency to ponder and to discuss the broader societal implications of these technologies. So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professors Fei-Fei Li, Jennifer Doudna, and Russ Altman. Well, welcome, and thank you for all the introductions. Uh, my name is Russ Altman, as you heard, and I am uh, very excited to be here. Uh, I was lucky enough to be at the dinner that Rob hosted where it occurred to us in the middle of this dinner that this was uh, two people in the middle of two revolutions and that um, the immense joy we had at the discussion 10 months ago really should be shared with the world. So it's incredibly exciting to be here. This reminds me to tell you that there will be Q&A, but it will be very high tech. Um, on your cards, excuse me, there's a card that you should have gotten and on the back of it, there is a website that you will uh, visit with your phone if you have a phone that does this. Uh, you will go to sli.do, which is a website, and you will have a, a password which is CRISPR AI, C R I S P R A I, and you will type in your question. And that will go through the miracle of technology to an iPod that I will be holding. 
and I will um, look at those questions and pick some of them. We are trying to make sure that we have a good chunk of time for Q&A because that's always the most fun and it'll be where you can, um, can fix all the mistakes I make in questions that I forget to ask. Okay, that will be later. So uh, I'm very excited to have these two pioneers with us tonight and thank you very much for coming. Uh, we uh, are, have two revolutions that are simultaneously happening. You've heard a, a little bit about it from Margaret and from uh, uh, the president and from Rob. Uh, we don't have time to do a technical briefing on these, so I will just summarize, as, as you may know, uh, that in the case of Dr. Doudna, we have a discovery that has led to an ability to edit DNA, edit genomes, pr pretty much for the purposes of today's discussion at will, uh, and also to use this technology for other um, very specific addressing inside the genome to do things like turn things on, turn things off, uh, which can be applied to, to everything from bacteria to humans. There's your technical briefing on that. <laughs> in the case of Dr. Lee, we have the beginning of a revolution in deep learning and the associated machine learning technologies that are starting to find their way into all aspects of life. They're in the background when you do Google searches, when you get on Facebook. They're in the f not so much background when you do Amazon purchases and things are presented to you. you are, if you talk to your phone or if you talk to little cylinders in your kitchen uh, and they talk back, uh, and image recognition uh, uh, applications that are kind of exploding from security to uh, other aspects of commerce. And all of this is based on initial findings that uh, came out in the early 2010s uh, and led in, in, in a large part by Dr. Lee. So my question, my first question uh, to Fei-Fei, and then we're going to go to Jennifer as well. Was it obvious that the results you were reporting back when you were reporting them was going to be such a big deal and lead to a revolution, or was just this a paper like all your other papers, or was there an awareness? Great question, um, Russ. Um, I guess you're referring to my 2009 paper on ImageNet and the 2012 ImageNet challenge result by uh, a group of Canadian scientists uh, led by Professor Jeff Hinton that won the ImageNet uh, classification challenge where computers are able to recognize a thousand different uh, daily uh, Im uh, objects in everyday imageries, and that was the first time that uh, um, we see that kind of progress in computer science. I think as a scientist, I, when we let the ImageNet work and, and put forward this um, ImageNet challenge, we knew that we were driving at a very big, what we call holy grail question in computer vision and AI, which is the question of, enabling computers to recognize um, a huge um, um, plethora of uh, objects in everyday life. And that's an ability that humans um, have, but keep in mind evolution took 540 million years to achieve that. And we were going after that question. So from that point of view, we knew it was a big question we're trying to answer. And when seeing the result in 2012, it was a big scientific step. But I would be lying to say if I, uh, I recognize the, the societal implication and impact in 2012. We, we knew the scientific significance, but I wasn't aware of the, the ensuing explosive exponential um, um, increase in, in, in societal is through the commercial sector and, and others. So, so Jennifer, for the CRISPR revolution, uh, the, you, you often describe it as a curiosity-driven research. This is the immune system of some bacteria, not uh, obviously a revolution. But as these discoveries were coming, was it obvious for you? So I think an, an interesting uh, difference from what you just described, Fei-Fei, is that it sounds like in your work, you were very much, very actively going after an important goal in computer science. Right. And I think for, for us, those of us that were working in the world of CRISPR, which is this bacterial immune system, very obscure, 
Uh, before 2012, this was a field that was populated by a, literally a handful of labs around the world that were studying a very, you know, sort of uh, uh, esoteric area of biology. And so in my own work, we were investigating how this worked. I was fascinated with it because of the evolution of a system in bacteria that I thought paralleled something that happens in human and plant cells, and I was trying to understand those distinctions. But for us, when we did this curiosity-driven project that led to an understanding of how this system could be harnessed to trigger changes in DNA, and we realized that could you know, work in any, any type of DNA, including in genomes, that for us was kind of, kind of the light bulb going off and saying, oh, this, you know, this project is clearly going in a very different direction than where it started. And, and for me, um, you know, did I realize initially that it would be a big deal? I would say that it was very clear from the work going on in the genome engineering field in general, which was in existence before the CRISPR technology, that this was an important thing to be able to do to manipulate genomes. It was just that it was very difficult to do it up until that point. And I think for us, the, the really kind of exciting connection was realizing that this really esoteric thing we were studying was merging with a very important area of biotechnology in a way that would be broadly enabling. And, that, and that's, you know, so that was true. Now, could I have predicted uh, CRISPR babies and everything at that point? No, for sure not. But I think it was clear to all of us that were working on this that um, this was really an exciting breakthrough in biotechnology. So the, 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 this, I just love this. But <laughs> one of the things that you both have said is you knew it was big, but the degree to which big is big and then there's really big. And the degree to which it would take off might not have been clear. One aspect of how it took off is the... The fact that we're hosted today by a center for ethics is the ethical yeah. um, implications of the technology. So maybe starting with you, Jennifer, did you have a moment where you said, holy cow, this is now getting into things that I wasn't expecting in terms of ethics? You were a bench biochemist, and now there's these amazing ethical questions. Um, how did that come to your attention, and did you hesitate to engage? Um, okay, so first of all, you're absolutely right that you know I'm a biochemist and somebody who's always done very fundamental research. And for me, I think it was really you know what happened in our in the field of, of CRISPR and genome editing was that you know we published a paper in the middle of 2012 describing how the system could be used for genome editing. And before the end of that year, there were already several uh, academic papers that were submitted to journals that were describing how it could be actually used in practice to engineer genomes. And then throughout 2013, you know, it, it just, it was clear that this was just it, it taking off incredibly quickly. And by early 2014, there were already scientists who were using CRISPR to engineer the genomes of animals, including monkeys, in the germline, so making heritable changes in monkeys. And um, even though before that, I had sort of occasionally thought to myself, gee, I, I wonder if this could be used in humans and in, in, in human embryos, that I think it was the monkey work when that was published in early 2014 when I thought, holy smokes, you know, there's, there's just no reason to think that people maybe even right now are already starting to do experiments of that type. And I think that was really, for me, the, the moment when I thought, I need, to, I need to get involved, even though I, and I was quite reluctant, I have to say. I felt like this is an area I don't know anything about, uh, but I felt a real responsibility to engage in that discussion and start trying to put the word out that this is happening, the technology is moving very, very quickly. Regulatory agencies, governments are not even aware of this yet. But in the science world, this is a big deal. So I want to hear your story about this, Feifei. But let me mention, you've already heard something very interesting that I'd just like to highlight, which is Feifei mentioned a paper in 2012, and Jennifer just mentioned a paper in 2012. And I think when we went back, these pa two papers occurred within a couple of months of one another in totally different literatures, in totally different journals. But this 2012, I think it was fall, uh, or late summer, that's a big moment in this whole story, and it's an amazing coincidence that we're within weeks of these papers being published. So, Fei Fei, what, is there, was there a moment, or is it more um, less, less moment, momentous, uh, when you said, uh-oh, this is ethical, and 
there's ethical issues, and do I want to get involved? Yeah, so um, 10 months ago when Jennifer and I had this private dinner conversation at Stanford, I heard um, a summary of what you just said, and the thing that struck me the most is the striking parallelism in, in timing that the moment 2012 started the first paper in Deep Learning Revolution, um, I still remember that fall I flew to Florence, Italy to announce the ImageNet Challenge uh, result. I think it's in uh, September and the paper came out in December. Okay. And, um, and starting that point, it was a parallel story. By 2013, the deep learning technology is taking the academic um, world of computer science uh, and AI by storm. You're getting just many paper submissions and um, publications in computer vision, in natural language processing, in speech recognition. And, um, and also, um, possibly a small, probably not so small, difference between biology and AI is by 2013, the commercial world, the tech companies are moving fast into deep learning. We're starting to hear um, deep learning startups already getting acquired um, uh, uh, by um, big tech. And by 2014, which early 2014, the moment that kind of hit me um, by surprise is suddenly in the public media, we're hearing people talking about AI as summoning the demon. And I remember uh, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Steve Hawkins, all went into public uh, media and start to talk about the amazing concern about AI and, and, and the evidence was this new um, revolution of deep learning, which is really incredible to me because probably less than 12 months ago, I felt my whole career, career was in a field that nobody cared about. <laughs> <laughs> and just within a year, suddenly our field is, is the demon that <laughs> is being summoned. And, um, and I start to really thinking deeply about the connection between humanity's future and the field that I went in as a scientific curiosity. And uh, 2014 was a defining year personally for me to get into this. Just like Jennifer said, I, um, it, was, it was reluctant from a personality point of view. I wasn't looking for that uh, angle, but it's really that sense of responsibility that uh, I was part of this generation, part of this group of scientists that brought this technology to this point. And now it has a serious impact in humanity's future. What should I do? And it was that kind of realization, similar to yours, that brought me into this. So, so these two revolutions, I mean, I don't think I'm putting too fine a point on it to say they both really um, put the nature of humanity and, and fundamental questions about humanity in the focus. Uh, in the case of CRISPR, we now have the ability to modify ourselves, okay? I'm not saying we should or will, but this is a capability to re-engineer, to reprogram the human genome. In the case of AI, we have an ability to have machines that perform as well or better than us at, at tasks that were traditionally considered uniquely human tasks of like recognizing faces and, and many others. So these really go to the question of the future of humanity and, and, and choices that we need to make. So you both said that you, you, at some time in 2014, you both had this very parallel realization that this was more than about technology. And you became, in, in, in fact, in some ways, public intellectuals as uh, an old, it's an old fashioned term, but this is what you are now. And my question is, um, how did you prepare or what prepared you to engage in a set of conversations um, that were entirely outside of your formal training, or I presume were mostly outside of your formal training? And how did you even think about engaging in these new audiences and new conversations? Jennifer, <laughs> there's an easy question. Yeah, well, in my case, I had a lot of hesitation. I have to be frank, you know, I, I, I like you, Feifei, I felt a personal sense of responsibility on the one hand, 
On the other hand, I thought, you know, there are people who do this professionally, and maybe we should leave it to them to think about this. But, uh, but in the end, I, I really felt deeply that uh, the scientists who are involved in fundamental research of the type, you know, that we had done with CRISPR needed to engage because, who else, you know, in the end, who else really deeply understands the science? So I, um, I actually, uh, the first step that I took was to convene a meeting in the Napa Valley with scientists who had been involved in, in our field in a, a very important meeting that was held back in the mid-1970s called the Asilomar meeting, which was at Asilomar, and was held to discuss something called molecular cloning, which was back at what many people consider to be kind of the birth of modern biotechnology was when people had figured out in the 1970s, and a lot of the fundamental work was actually done here at Stanford um, with Cohen and, and Boyer and others, uh, that uh, you could... The UC system also made some contributions. A few. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out, Russ. I appreciate that. You know, I'm wearing Stanford colors tonight. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, in the 70s when this happened, it was an exciting time when people had figured out how to cut and paste pieces of DNA, and, and that lit, triggered a, a big revolution in biotechnology. A lot of, you know, early companies in this field like Genentech and others that got started around that time. But people at that time also recognized that there were some real uh, or at least perceived risks to the technology, and that Asilomar meeting addressed those risks and it was kind of the idea of scientists coming together and trying to ask can we police ourselves can we control our own technology that that we're developing so in that same kind of spirit we organized a meeting in early 2015 with a couple of the scientists who had been at the Asilomar conference Paul Berg from Stanford and and uh, David Baltimore from Caltech and then a number of other folks some of them are here tonight and uh, it was, that for me was the beginning of my own education, really, about how you even approach a complicated question about technology, where it's going, how do we, how do we educate people, how do we educate regulatory agencies, how do we think about it ourselves, uh, you know, and about where we would like to see this going, what role should scientists be playing in, in all of this. So that was hugely helpful. And frankly, it's, I've been on a trajectory ever since. I feel like a student again in many ways of kind of learning how to think about this and how to approach it. So this is a constant part of your life now. This, constant. This is a part, and you consider it part of your job. I do. Yeah. So as you realize these challenges, how did you manage it, Fei-Fei? So first of all, I totally agree with Jennifer. It's a constant part of my learning. I still feel like a student in the, in the topic of ethics and and you know, machine learning fairness and, and all this. Um, in 2014, we, we just talk about this personal realization that, uh, that uh, I feel that sense of, a sense of responsibility. What is slightly different from the world of uh, biology is that uh, CS is a much younger discipline that does not have a ethics sub area at all. And I didn't know who to talk to. I, I, there was, it was probably the lack of my own knowledge, but I don't know who was doing CS ethics or, or, or AI ethics. Just nobody talks about this. So what I um, kind of gravitated towards was a very important topic, both personal to me, but also connected me to the humanity issues of AI was diversity and inclusion because when I hear these people on radios or podcasts or TV talking about summoning the demon and terminators coming next door, I was thinking what I was really asking myself what is the fundamental issue here? Is they're worried about the drivers of this technology um, going against humanity and creating that kind of um, um, adversarial creature or, or piece of technology that would be harmful for, for uh, humanity or, or society. And as soon as I landed on the question, who are the drivers of AI, I realized the real problem in 2014 is we have a serious crisis in the representation, human representation 
of this technology, and that's the lack of women, lack of underrepresented minority. And 2014, uh, um, um, around summertime, um, a PhD student at that time in my lab, her name is Olga Rusakovsky. It was her last year of PhD, and she came to me and said, she was bothered by this problem of lack of human representation and she wanted to do something together. So we decided that we are going to pilot a uh, summer program at Stanford AI Lab to invite high school students from underrepresented background, mostly women, to um, come and study um, AI for a few weeks and uh, approach this tech, invite them into this technology through a human-centered perspective um, and, and encourage these underrepresented students to become tomorrow's leaders. Um, fast forward 2015, similar to your um, Napa meeting, was the first uh, summer camp at Stanford for what now we call AI for All program. Um, and that was the first class. And then we did it again in 2016, and the reception of that uh, program was just so, um, so positive, and, and we realized we have to scale this nationally. So 2017, we uh, um, established a national nonprofit called AI for All, and started to putting out these summer programs for, to invite underrepresented and, um, students and underserved community to take part in AI study and research. And by 2019, this summer, we have 11 campuses or 11 programs in uh, North America. We've graduated more than 500 alums of um, young women, uh, racial minority, low-income class students, rural students, and uh, we're still scaling. And that journey to um, increase the, the human representation and diversity and inclusion of AI um, was the starting point of my own personal journey in, in advocating for uh, ethics, uh, ethical um, guideline and treatment of, of AI. It's a fascinating and really almost brilliant idea that the way to start this is to create a bigger tent uh, and then to let the other issues play out with a group of people who are more representative of the society at large. And, and is, it, does it seem like that's happening? Are the voices being heard? Are those, I guess, young people, are they considering this part of their mission going forward? So, so Russ, the truth is I can sit here for hours to talk about the f amazing students and alumni of AI for All. We've been doing this for... Um, four years, so the first class coming out of Stanford are now, are now um, freshmen in, um, in um, college. And we have some incredible young people now um, advocating for AI ethics, machine learning, um, machine learning fairness, AI policy. So, so the mission of AI for All was really about um, making sure that tomorrow's technologists and AI thought leaders a much more diverse um, and, and thinking through the human lens. But I think what also happened along the way, and it's not just my own effort, is that the world of AI, especially academic AI, is starting to wake up to this, um, to this important technology and its ethical implications. So now the, the talk about um, and efforts in AI ethics goes beyond just diversity and and inclusion it includes many different yeah. angles now. So I want to move to a, a topic that I think is actually quite related, but it will sound different, which is the industry take up of your technologies. Um, I think both of you have seen a very rapid take up. And I'd like you to just characterize um, your impression of how that's going. Does it raise uh, concern, or is it uh, re rewarding and reassuring? Um, what's the status of CRISPR in industry? and? Um, is that, are the academics, are the roles of academics and industry clear? Are they competitive? How are things playing out? And are you happy with what you're seeing? Right, so in, in, the, in the world of CRISPR, so in 2013, there were already a number of uh, companies that were getting going and investors that were starting to sniff around and sense there was something big happening. 
And so there were several companies that got launched that year, I think by, around by the end of, the end of 2013. And uh, today there are th three of those companies have gone public, so they are now publicly traded. And one of them actually made a big announcement today about having actually used CRISPR-Cas9 in two patients that have blood disorders, sickle cell disease and, and thalassemia, and, and reporting some exciting uh, results, given, granted it's two patients. But um, you know, I think that sort of is a testament to the very interesting, very rapid advances that are being made with this technology already in the clinics. We're already seeing benefits to patients. This is not in the germline, right? This is treating individuals. But I think it, you know, it at least, you know, looks so far. It looks, looks just like for it the, for those well. of you who are not biologists, a germline modification would be one that would then be passed on to your children and their children. Right. So it would be fixed, or at least in the human population and in your offsprings. It's also possible to um, make changes to the DNA that's local to that one person, but will not be passed on to their progeny. And so those, that's a big difference in both ethical and technical circles. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, I, and I should be clear that the vast majority of companies that I'm aware of right now that are using CRISPR are using it for, uh, you know, making changes in individuals, but not in not in the germline, not for heritable uh, changes. Um, and then a couple other comments on on uh, on what's happening commercially. So, as you alluded to in the beginning, your technical intro. Uh, CRISPR is a technology that is broadly impacting all of the biological sciences, really. And so it's not just in biomedicine, but it's also impacting agriculture. It's impacting uh, synthetic biology and companies that make reagents and all that sort of thing. So I would argue, I, would, I, I think that if you were to look at many established companies that work in, in the fields of agriculture and, and, and these other areas that affect uh, uh, biology, a lot of them are using CRISPR technology now as a, you know, as a tool, as something they, they use in the course of their, their uh, product development. So that's going on. And then, um, you know, in the area of, of human germline editing, uh, there's very frankly uh, commercial interest in this. I think that uh, companies that are involved in egg freezing, in, um, you know, reproductive technologies, in vitro fertilization, are you know certainly paying attention to this? That, that's my perception, based on the kinds of phone calls and emails that I get from entrepreneurs who are thinking about that space, and uh, and and I think that will remain an active area of commercial interest going forward. It's very hard for me to know right now how quickly that area will develop, and certainly I will, maybe we'll discuss it um, here in this conversation. But, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, an area that is, there's a lot of, uh, of issues, uh, technical, but of course also ethical when we start talking about making heritable changes and especially selling that to people, making claims about it and charging money for it. Uh, in, claim, you know, these are changes that affect, uh, you know, could, could affect, uh, people for, you know, their whole sort of family, uh, structure and generations. So, yeah. Is the academic, uh, is there a good equilibrium between what's going on in industry and what's going on in, in, in academics? I'm kind of anticipating some comments that uh, mm -hmm. Feifei may have. Yeah. Uh, is there any problem with, for example, uh, brain drain from academia? Uh, do we still have a good ecosystem or has there been a tilt that's worrisome? I think there's still a, good, a very good ecosystem between uh, what happens academically and research that goes on there and what happens in companies. However, I've noticed just in, you know, this is very statistics of small numbers, but, you know, I've been running an academic research lab for 25 years. The vast majority of students that I've trained in my lab in that period of time have gone, in the past at least, have gone uh, the academic route largely. A uh, few of them have gone into industry in the past, but a lot of them stayed in, in academic science in different ways. And just over the last two or three years, I've seen a very interesting change where my very best students, and, and actually last year I had five students graduate with their PhDs from my lab. In the end, all five went to startup companies. And all five are doing CRISPR-related work, but in startup companies. And I think that says something. It's, it's small numbers, but it does say that some of the very most talented people that are coming out right now that see the potential of this technology feel like the best way that they can do creative work in this space is to do it 
in a, a, a startup a company that's got a lot of capital coming in, a lot of smart people that are you know, focused on solving a problem, and they've got a technology to do it, and they just want to get in there and get it done. And in some ways, that they feel that that's a, uh, biotech is a better place to do that than in an academic setting. Yeah, so Feifei, I, yeah. I imagine you might have things to contribute on this issue. What is your sense of the equilibrium between academics and uh, industry? What kind of industry? What, what, where are we? I suppose industry has heard of the word AI by now. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like the world before 2012 and after 2012, especially after 2016, after AlphaGo, is just turned upside down for academia in many ways. Because um, I've also been an academia professor for almost 20 years, um, actually, no, 15 years, and, <laughs> and plus PhD, 20 years. And uh, most of my um, professional life and scientific career this is just about scientific curiosity. You know, companies are doing similar things, but by and large, we're doing basic science research. I, I feel like some of the problems that my lab was working on before 2012, industry was not even interested in. Granted, ImageNet paper in 2009 was a poster, a small poster in a conference that most people didn't pay attention to. So. And then deep learning revolution came. Within months, the onslaught of industry attention just, just took the whole world, AI, uh, our world by, by surprise, especially academic world. Now, no matter what metric you look at, um, whether it's the amount of investment by big companies in machine learning, deep learning, AI, or the number of startups, or the number of uh, peer-reviewed academic paper, uh, papers published by industry labs, or the number of students going to um, uh, startup and industry career versus faculty career, all this metric is showing the intense, explosive interest investment of industry in the area of AI. And added on top of that, this technology deeply depends on two important things. One is compute, which means the chips, the GPUs, the CPUs, the machines, and the, one, the other one is data. And both elements of AI are now more or less, by and large, in the hands of uh, uh, companies that have the money to buy the compute or create the compute and have the data. So the world of AI research and R&D is definitely now heavily tilted towards industry. But having said that, I mean, we're in Stanford and, and Russ, we work together in uh, HAI and, and just Stanford AI labs. Um, there is amazing amount of work happening also in academia. And, and frankly, I think many interesting work and forward looking work um, that is not necessarily of immediate commercial value are happening in, in academia that I feel very excited about. But I think the reality is that um, the commercial world has just really swept this whole, you know, changed yes. the landscape. So of often when people talk about academic research and industrial research, in the past, the sense was industrial research is a shorter timeline mm -hmm. with deliverables you know, like because they're on a quarterly reporting schedule, uh, whereas academic research would be a longer horizon. Is that still a thing uh, in, in your, each of your fields, or are those boundaries be, be, being blurred? So time yes, horizon boundaries. Yes, and I think in, uh, in AI, the boundary is being blurred because uh, some of the, the companies, especially tech industry, recognize the importance of this technology. So the leadership is willing to invest in longer term research within industry and, and willing to invest both in terms of timeline as well as freedom. And that enables researchers in, in industry to work on more longer horizon problems that used to be traditionally in academia. And, uh, and, and that really blurs the line. Of course, I still say that uh, 
those of us working in academ academia do not have product pressure. We do not think so much about commercial endpoints. So we still have that freedom. But I think by and large, the line has blurred a lot in, in, in AI. So Jennifer, in the, in the CRISPR industry world, is the, is the great activity, and I mean great in, in, in magnitude, uh, activity that's happening, is that leading to any issues with respect to bottling up of IP and potential long-term problems with academics and new discoveries being in some way um, uh, frozen or more difficult because of um, intellectual property landscape? Well, in the CRISPR world, of course, there's a very public, very famous you know, patent fight that's ongoing that's kind of always going on in the background. But the interesting thing is that it really hasn't stymied, um, you know, I would say, scientific advances. Companies have gotten started. Uh, I, hear new, I hear about new companies virtually every day in the space. And, and uh, you know, in, in lots of, you know, billions of dollars in capital have been invested in, in CRISPR commercially. So that, that's going on. Uh, of course, academic labs are carrying on uh, as And they, they're not getting uh, cease and desist orders from companies saying you're in violate, in general, you're violating our, our patents, you're violating our, because no, that would be a chilling, I would guess that would be very chilling. Correct. And, and I think that could happen in the future. You could imagine if there are exciting products that come out of CRISPR, as people anticipate there will be, that will be uh, the kind of thing that could happen yeah. in the future. But currently, it's at the level of research. So I think, for the most part, you know, whether research is going on in companies or academically, it's just it's just fast and furious. And I think for you know, in our field, what what really happened, and I you know, I'm, I'm sure this is true. It sounds very parallel to what you're describing. Um, that you know, that this the, you know, things started off very quiet, but they took off kind of exponentially, right? And that's absolutely what happened with CRISPR. And so what what was a very sleepy field with just a handful of people working mm -hmm. a few years ago is now hotly competitive, you know, lots and lots of people working. Uh, you can't open up a journal these days without reading a, a CRISPR paper. And, and you know, and, and um, I think that there's a, whether you're working in an academic lab or whether you're working in a company, there's a feeling of, you know, I got I to gotta get moving because other people are mm -hmm. out there working. And if I've had an idea, probably somebody else has had the same idea. So. Um, the, you know, that, that very much is, yeah. is sort of agnostic to whether it's academic or, or commercial. But I do think that, um, that uh, in, in, and I, I'd be curious how you think about IP in, this, in, in, a, in the AI space, but certainly in the world of CRISPR, there's, you know, there, there's this sort of foundational fight over the foundational IP, but then beyond that, so many companies and so many academic labs, I mean, you can't imagine, right? It's probably thousands and thousands of patents, maybe it's tens of thousands now that have been filed on you know, ideas that have come out of CRISPR and you know, things that people are doing, whether it's new technologies or whether it's applications of CRISPR. And so that's just driven this huge kind of you know, layer of intellectual property that's been developed. And what will be interesting to see, and we're, you know, we're just kind of living through it right now, is how that will play out in the future as all of that leads to actual products that come right. to market and have real value and then you know how those uh, how those patents will 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 sort out. It's not clear yet how that'll happen. So it sounds like a good story of everybody's kind of publishing, and there's a, right now a sense of not too many uh, barriers to discovery and innovation. How is it in AI? Are, is the great company presence in AI? Is that are, are they publishing? Are they are they making their algorithms open, or is there a sense that there is a certain bottling up of things and and lack of transparency? Great question, Ross and, and Jennifer. You mentioned IP. So the world of computer science is a little different. Um, at least just from my perspective, the IP has not been at the forefront of the world I live in because, first of all, we, uh, we open source a lot of our codes, our data, our um, our, our papers, as soon as it's written before peer review, these days we upload it on archive. So, and even the company research groups tend to do that, of course. Um, so from that point of view, I, unless I'm naive, I don't think we're gonna find some company calling us and say you infringed on right. our IP. Right. That kind of bottleneck we're not facing. Um, in terms of, um, 
so so again, I, I, like I said, they do have in industry researching AI the the resource, the compute right. resource, and the data resource, and the engineering resource are significantly more than, than academia. So so that differentiates. It differentiates the kind of research. It differentiates the kind of projects. Um, you know, for example, AlphaGo, everybody knows about it, is an engineering feat that it's hard, much harder to imagine that academia would take on. The, the, the amount of just engineering of that system, um, that it's much more likely, and indeed it happened in industry. So, um, so that's a little different. But, uh, but um, um, one thing I do want to say is that one thing I find very um, hopeful and, 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 and participating and also observing uh, with a lot of curiosity is that um, more and more of my colleagues, and including myself, because of this intense industry pressure of their uh, the research, were differentiating in a different way. You know, um, academic AI research right now is moving into a much more cross-disciplinary fashion that would, you know, like my personal research, I, I work with the doctors in Stanford Hospital, bio, uh, ethicists and, and law scholars in, in a, uh, or behavioral psychologists in a way that um, it's harder to be done in industry. And it takes full advantage of the academic Exactly, and I, I'm starting to see that at least uh, at Stanford as well as the Cal, uh, <laughs> we see that uh, happening and I'm, I'm actually I'm actually very, very excited by that uh, move, movement mm -hmm. in academia. So we're getting very close to the time when I want to get to your question. So maybe I'll, I'll end with this kind of general question, which is um, revolutions such as the ones that you've helped lead will happen in the future again. From your experience over the last, I guess, seven years, how is society set up to respond to them? Uh, have, have we learned things, and, or do you, think there, do you believe that there are things we should be doing to prepare for the next kind of inevitable wave of innovation? Since you've been in the tempest, I'm wondering what advice, if any, you would give policymakers or governmental officials about ways to manage these uh, explosive innovation, innovative technologies? It's a big question, I recognize. <laughs> Well, um, I guess two aspects. First, I think we haven't seen the ending of the AI story at all. It's just the beginning. And uh, I think we need to recognize that uh, as we push forward this technology, we've got to work just as hard, if not harder, on putting the boundaries, the ethical guidelines uh, into this, the development and deployment of this technology. If there is one piece of, not advice, but wishful thinking I can give to policymakers or just leaders of our civil society, um, at least from technology perspective, I would still come back to invest in the people, invest in the diverse and inclusive group of people who should be together at the driver's seat of any technology and discovery, because by investing in that most diverse group of people, we ensure that human representation is maximally there, and, and, and whatever we make together collectively is in the interest of the, the maximum um, humanity. I would just add to that that I would like to see more scientists in in Congress, you know, in, in, uh, in government. I mean, it's very interesting that, you know, thank you, yes, right? Uh, you know, I, I was really, really struck when I went to, when the first time that I went to Capitol Hill to talk about uh, CRISPR technology, that I met with Bill Foster, who pointed out that he was the only PhD in Congress. He pointed out the same thing to me when I went to yeah. Congress. <laughs> yeah, he's very proud of it. Uh, you know, but but this is this is a problem. So I think I think we really need to advocate for more uh, diversity in our in our representatives, including uh, some scientists. I can't help but think that you probably live in different districts, and I'm thinking. <laughs> Well, well, okay, so very good. So I want to remind you, 
<laughs> uh, that SLI.do with a event code C R I S P R, CRISPR AI, all one word, is where the questions can come in. I'm now going to go check to see if there are any questions. There are. Whoa. <laughs> um, what's the biggest criticism facing CRISPR today, and how do you answer it? The one, I guess it's the one that you hear the most. Well, let's see, the biggest criticism of, of CRISPR, I guess the biggest criticism, I mean, you know, CRISPR babies have gotten a lot of attention in the media. And I guess the thing that I hear about the most is, um, is I don't know if it's a criticism, it's really a question about, about that. But, but the flip side of it is people who write to me, I virtually every day, I get at least one email a day, from uh, somebody who has a genetic disease themselves or genetic disease in their family. And a lot of these are, you know, real, I mean, I'm just, I'm really honored that people share their personal stories with me. It's really touching. And, um, and, and it's, not, it's not a criticism, but it's just a, a desperation, really, that's being expressed. It's, you know, how do, we, how do we accelerate the promise of this technology so that it can actually help my child at the time that they needed, or help my husband, uh, or help my mother, you know, it's that kind of thing. And, and so, and I feel this very personally myself, because I, I feel this, you know, in, in addition to the, you know, as academics, we always feel this, com you know, there's competition in the field, and I've got my, my papers published, but I feel, I feel it very differently now. I feel like patients are waiting. Yeah. Patients are waiting, and they can't wait very long. So we really need to get a move on and get this technology to a point where it can really, really help people. So I, I feel that urgency all the time. Um, this one is, I think, for Feifei, although we can all chime in. Uh, there's concern about the future of deep fake technology. So these are the very realistic, yeah. but fraudulent is one word, um, simulations of people speaking or their faces. Um, uh, what problems do you anticipate and how can they be mitigated? Yeah, so deep fake is, like Russ said, is, um, okay, let me take a step back. Um, creating um, imageries and, and, and videos and documents that are not real has always been there, right? We can even Photoshop um, fake pictures. But the recent AI advancement, especially a particular family of algorithm, has really accelerated and lowered the bar um, of creating um, fake imageries and speeches and, and, and videos. And already there's a lot of concern about disinformation and how that not uh, only um, participate in manipulating um, public minds and, and, and manip manipulating people as well as influencing the process of democracy and, and, uh, and even more severe um, severe consequences, especially if this uh, technology is being used and exploited by both nation states but non-nation states uh, actors. So um, mitigating, um, you know, I come to law. We, just like any technology, um, it, there should be laws to, to um, regulate, to govern, um, um, the, the malpractices of, of any piece of technology or tools and to incentivize good practices. So, so already there is a lot of uh, conversations and work starting to be done at the intersection between AI and uh, regulatory policies and laws. And I think we need to, you know, speaking of urgency, we need to accelerate that and, and make sure that's happening. And I know from your work in HAI that you've had boot camps for congressional staffers to try to increase the chances that they write draft laws that are helpful and not mm -hmm. harmful to everybody. Yeah, we have boot camp camps for staffers. We also have uh, now at Stanford uh, cross-listed uh, uh, classes between law school and CS and multiple ones looking at this in different angles. The next question is a little bit of a palate cleanser. Uh, it says, does the fact that Dr. Doudna's name can be read as do you DNA? <laughs> suggest, does that suggest that we are living in an AI simulation? 
<laughs> where the AI coders have a very good sense of humor. <laughs> Are there any comments? <laughs> If I had a nickel for every time someone's <laughs> pointed out that about my name, I'd be a rich woman. <laughs> um, there's a question. Um, I was going to say from anonymous, but these are all anonymous. Um, <laughs> uh, but it, it kind of goes to a question that uh, a comment that Fahey made. How do we encourage students and faculty to undertake the kind of interdisciplinary work that will be needed mm -hmm. to kind of address the ethical and societal challenges of both these technologies, uh, and, and encouraging them? encouraging them to avoid being stuck in an academic silo. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I could take a stab at that. So I, I was actually fascinated with what you just said about how your own work has evolved, it sounded like, from mm -hmm. being you know, focused more narrowly initially to now being broad enough that you're spanning you know, many of the schools represented disciplines here at Stanford that go well beyond science. I think that's extremely interesting. I, my own work, I would say, hasn't quite to that extent, you know, uh, sort of been that cross-cutting, but I think it could be in the future and it probably should be. And so what I did, you know, a few years ago was started the Innovative Genomics Institute in the Bay Area, which is right now, a, you know, a UC uh, partnership between Berkeley and, and UCSF. And, um, and that institute, in addition to fostering uh, applications of genome editing, is really focused around the future of the technology, very broadly speaking. So thinking about the legal aspects of it, the mm -hmm. uh, ethical aspects of it, the educational uh, you know, opportunities and challenges of, of genome editing. So increasingly, we use that institute as a way to, to do this, to try to encourage people to come in. We have, you know, we, we have a lecture series that isn't like a typical uh, uh, science departments lecture series where we have lawyers speaking, we have you know people in sociology that are speaking, we have people, we have uh, you know uh, business people. It just very, it is pretty broad. So I think that's what I'm trying to do yeah. to to spur that kind of uh, interaction. Yeah, so I, I guess I can speak both personally and also about the work at HAI, right? So personally, I just always find interdisciplinary work most fun. Even in my earlier days as a scientist, uh, crossing neuroscience and machine learning and computer vision is where the discovery, frontier of discovery is. And nowadays I find that if we wanna really work on questions that matter, you know, either to, to people's lives or, or to the implication of the technology, it naturally lends itself to the interdisciplinary um, boundaries. And, uh, and also, just like you, Jennifer, I think at Stanford, we sense so much appetite and demand by our faculty and students to be um, integrating in, in different ways that were traditionally not happening. So this is why at HAI we're crossing ethics, history, law, design thinking, medicine, education, sustainability. And just in less than half a year of our launch, we're seeing incredible research projects and courses and, and affinity groups and dialogues happening. And it seems like this is, uh, this is what the moment calls yeah. for now. I just want to thank you all. I have like nine screens of questions, and I also want to apologize <laughs> that we will not get to all of them, but I will try. Here's one. In a pluralistic world, and I think a lot of people worry about this, in a pluralistic world that is rapidly changing and highly decentralized, why should we expect any, why should we expect any alignment on ethics around the use of CRISPR or AI? And I think people are thinking about local, regional, national, international differences in um, how people think about uh, priorities. And so is, how do we think about this pluralistic world and the chances of, a, of having a, a, or should we think about a uniform ethical approach to these technologies? No. Well, we talked about this a little bit yeah, at, at dinner before, before we came, came in here. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. I actually think about this a lot. I think that, uh, and actually I was talking about it with uh, uh, President Tessier Levine, uh, the same issue, um, because we were talking about the fact that at least in, in our field in, in, in biology, as, we, as I alluded to earlier, in the 1970s, there was a meeting in California, the Asilomar meeting, that 
convene scientists to think about how to control the science of, of, uh, of, of molecular cloning that really did set a, an, an example of how a scientific community could come together to try to police itself with the use of the technology. And it wasn't perfect, but it was an interesting um, example of how that could, could happen. And I think it set a really good precedent for things that happened later in, in the biological sciences, including uh, CRISPR. However, you know, now, so that was in 1975, now in, you know, in, in the mid-2000s, now you know, the world of science has really changed. Science is much more global than it was at that time. Uh, there are many, many more scientists at that, than there were at that time. Technology like CRISPR can move around the globe incredibly quickly for a variety of, of, of reasons, but it, it's you know, really been enabling uh, in a way that you know, made the technology advance very, very rapidly with all the different labs that got involved with it quickly. But that also means that it, I, I think it is really challenging to think how you could build the same kind of community-wide consensus around how it should be utilized. And I think, I'm not sure how to do it. I, I've, I guess my, my hope is that there will be enough uh, you know, work internationally by highly respected scientists that we can at least have a, if not a you know, global consensus, at least a global framework that sets in, uh, a, a set of principles that will be, that become the, the basis for regulatory agencies globally to, to act. But whether that will really happen remains to be seen. So I agree. I think pluralism doesn't mean we shouldn't cooperate, doesn't mean we shouldn't listen and respect to the differences, either it's between individuals or groups or, or countries. I think when Jennifer and I had a conversation a few days ago, we, we actually talk about what would be our magic wand wish in the world of CRISPR and AI. And uh, both of us pretty much said exactly the same thing. If there were a magic wand, can there be an international framework where different groups can come together to agree on certain important things principles, of, of yeah. principles yeah. of CRISPR and AI, but also agree to cooperate in different ways that, that uh, matters for their own you know, different groups. Um, so I guess that's... So a, kind of related to that, there are a ton of questions, and that's why I'm going to be asking it, about the idea of every technology has a dual use. That is to say, the beneficial use that many times the inventors think of, and then the nefarious uses that other people think of, or maybe the inventor as well. And, and so I'm getting a lot of buzz here about warfare scenarios, dual use for both CRISPR, yeah. bioterrorism, as well as AI in, in the sense of weapons and automatic weapons. Uh, it's almost unfair, but how do you get yourself around these issues? And uh, do you have any thoughts about um, th this dual use issue and has it impacted you in, in significant ways? And do you worry about it? So my undergraduate degree is physics. And inevitably, I think about the, the, the nuclear physics and Manhattan projects and, and, and all that. So. Um, you're right that every technology is a dual use, is potentially can be dual use. I, I think this is why we need to talk about it. This is why we need to have ethical principles. This is why we need to have laws and international framework. So um, it's, uh, it, it, it's even more important that given how powerful these technologies are that uh, we anticipate these potential usages and dangers and, uh, and, and try to get ahead of ourselves as a society, as a country, as a species. And it speaks directly to your, all, both yeah. of your previous comments about an international framework would be very helpful in, in, in that setting, I would guess. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Go ahead. So there's, a, there's also a lot of questions about, do our young scientists and young engineers, do they get the training they need in ethics uh, for the future? And if so, good. <laughs> and if not, what needs to happen? 
They're, they're just to, you know, a young scientist, a young engineer, they're trying to acquire technical skills. Te they're trying to become virtuosos at their field. Um, they're working very hard. It is not easy to get them to put their head up and say, I would like you to think about the ethical implications. They say, yeah, 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 I'll do that at the end of, my, you know, later when I, have a big when I have a big discovery like these folks, then I'll start thinking about it. Um, has, has, is there a move towards changing the way we teach ethics to prof in, in professional education? So I want to share with you one moment and then answer the question. So I took a sabbatical at Google in 2017 and, and then went on to um, the larger half of 2018. And that was, 2018 was exactly the year many people call the tech lash happened. And I remember in the room with um, a group of very young Google engineers. And some of them, and when, when we were talking about the, the, the um, adversarial impact of technology um, and AI, and I literally, the most memorable moment was two young engineers, one woman, one, one man, was looking at me, because I was the leader in that group, in, almost in tears, and said to me, Fei Fei, we have great we are PhDs from top universities. We have great education in computer science. I know machine learning inside out. I can code TensorFlow. But when my friends and my family talk about these issues, you know, where there is fairness or weaponization or privacy, and I see the new stories that the, the technology that we could potentially create can harm people, I don't even know where to begin to think about this. I don't even have a language in my head mm. that I can, I can just p even speak of it. I had zero classes or zero training in this, yet now I'm a privileged engineer, software engineer, machine learning engineer, machine learning scientist in, in tech industry creating this. And I really felt that moment struck me so vividly. And I recognize that I, I was towards the end of my sabbatical, so I was returning to Stanford. I, it really speak to that sense of mission I, I, I had returning to academia as an educator that um, we absolutely need to prepare the current and the next generation so that no one in five, 10 years, or even two years, would be in the same situation and look at me in tears and not knowing what, what they can do about it because they had zero preparation. And here, I, right after I returned to Stanford, I really want to say that I just watch in admiration and, and give a lot of credits to my colleagues like Rob Reich, uh, Miran Sahami, um, Jeremy Weinstein, and, and Tino Crayer, many of my colleagues across Stanford campus um, from ethics, from law, are, uh, from computer science, are coming together and start to uh, teach classes like this. Uh, Rob, your class had 300 students sign up last, last time it's offered. And uh, so the short answer is, Russ, it's not enough, but it's, hap it's happening, and we need this to be happening in every single university and college campuses and possibly in, um, in, in even earlier part of our K-12 education. I would say in, in, uh, in my field in biology, uh, we're probably not as far along, oddly enough, as maybe you are with the, in terms of education about ethical impacts of technology. This is just my, my personal perception of it because what I see at Berkeley, where I teach a, I teach a very large uh, undergraduate class in molecular biology for sophomore level undergraduate students. And, um, and, and we don't, you know, we don't, in that class, we don't get into ethics really at all. We focus on, you know, we talk about, we talk about CRISPR, but we talk about it from a sci the science perspective of it. Um, and, and all the other developments that have happened in biology, we're talking about the science and, and trying to educate students about that, but not about the broader impacts of the science and how we think about it. And partly it's just because, you know, we have a packed curriculum, there's a ton of stuff to teach, and, you know, 
But, uh, but I think it also is just a cultural thing in our field that um, you know, we're, we're still very much in the vein of creating scholars who deeply know their subject, the science, and, and subject defined pretty, pretty narrowly, I would say, rather than saying we need to create uh, people who are, you know, educate people who are going to be knowledgeable broadly, not only about the details of the science, but also the impact of the science. And I'm not quite sure how to do that. And also, you kind of alluded to this, but what I see also is that a lot of students that come into our field don't, you know, kind of don't necessarily feel drawn to the bioethical questions. And they feel like, yeah, I'll, do, I'll worry about that later if I do something that has ethical implications. I'll worry about it then. But right now, you know, I want to get my PhD or I want to publish my next paper or something. And I don't want to take time away from that to think about these, these bigger things. So there are a lot of questions on a lot of topics. But I think as we end in the last four minutes, there's a lot of questions about equality and justice. They're not all positive. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you, tell me the dream scenario for how each of your technologies will uh, lead to improved justice and improved equality and fairness uh, in human uh, endeavors, because I would prefer to end that way. There's a lot of yeah. more <laughs> negative in, implication in some of the questions. <laughs> so in AI, um, my dream scenario, right? Um, so on equity and justice, this is a technology that can, to start with, can call out injustice. It has enough powerful algorithm to detect the pattern of bias, pattern of injustice, and, and pattern of unfair whatever treatment of people or, or, or situations. So that's, that's one positive usage, uh, usage. This is also a technology that can lower the barrier of entry and lower the, the barrier or, or cost. It can make medicine more accessible. It can, um, um, you know, improve access of education, medicine, transportation, potentially financial resources. This is a technology that can um, improve productivity by augmenting people, not replacing people. And my dream industry for AI to help is government. <laughs> <laughs> here, here. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it also is a technology that can really um, tackle, help us humans to tackle global issues like climate change, like you know environment, like medicine, education. So, so this, these are the I can go on and on, but these are dream scenarios. But they're not necessarily just daydreams, we can work towards that. And, and I know many of my colleagues are working towards that. At dinner, we had a great discussion about public, av publicly available data from the government that's not particularly sensitive, traffic you pointed out, other things. Weather. Where This is where um, the public, the academics and other public uh, uh, interest groups can do work on, on this data and it's freely available and it won't be bottled up by companies necessarily. And so it, it represents truly a great uh, opportunity. So dream yeah. scenarios for CRISPR. So CRISPR, I think, you know, there's, there's two sides of the CRISPR coin in a way. So on the one hand, CRISPR is a, a, a truly democratizing technology. That's one of the reasons why it has taken off as fast as it has. It puts a powerful tool in the hands of anyone who has a little bit of knowledge of molecular biology, for better or worse. But it's meant that, I mean, this is one of the reasons it took off the way it did and why we're on this trajectory, is that uh, labs around the world have been able to get a hold of it and, and use it to do research on essentially any uh, biological system and get information and, and start, you know, sort of driving forward their research programs at a pace that wasn't possible previously. So uh, that, I think has really been a very positive thing for the most part. 
Um, the flip side is that when you start to think about the applications of CRISPR, and let's just, just think about biomedicine, you know, with the announcement today, for example, about you know, being able to use it to, to, in principle, cure sickle cell disease. I mean, this is phenomenal. But it's not going to do a lot of people a lot of good if that technology, if that cure costs $2 million a patient. Uh, so what I am there very, are treatments that cost two million dollars. I mean, it's cr you know it's crazy, and so uh, we're we're really you know, and this is one thing that I think academics can really contribute to this is to think hard about how are we going to take this very exciting development and the way that it could be deployed biomedically, but do it in a sustainable, affordable way. I think it will require more technology development, you know, but maybe things that companies won't want to invest in because they will take a, it'll take a little bit longer to do it. Um, so I think that's one, one thing that has to be addressed. And then we didn't talk about it tonight, but I'll just throw out there that I think one of the biggest impacts, maybe the biggest ultimately uh, impact of CRISPR will be in agriculture. It'll be in the food that we're eating. And I think that, again, has the potential to be widely, you know, democratizing. Um, if, if handled appropriately, and that, you know, that'll happen both in academic labs but, but also in uh, companies over time. Well, I think we're at time. I want to thank you both for both your scientific contributions, your contributions to the ethical and societal discussions of these technologies, your time today. I want to thank our hosts, our host organizations, and I want to thank all of you and your 90 questions <laughs> which didn't go answered. Uh, thank you to all. Yeah, thank you.